buckle up because this is going to be a long one. Today we're having a look at the 2010 Mathematics Extension to HSC and this is back in the days when the HSC examinations for Extension 2 were just eight questions. So therefore uh, this question we're looking at right now is the last question um, and usually the 15 mark allocation is sort of distributed across a few different parts and you'll see different parts here but the difference is that all of these parts are really all connected. Um, we're used to having part A and part B and part C being separate when they really want you to make it, um, when they want to make it very obvious to you that it's like, oh, these are all part of one, you know, continuous line of working. They'll say part A and then like one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, if they give you a really, really long one, right? And sometimes, you know, we've talked about the fact that some questions, especially if there's diagrams or um, if perhaps it's a mechanics question where they have to introduce a lot of a physical situation and describe it in very explicit terms, um, I will sometimes colloquially say it's like, whoa, this is one of those one pager questions where the single question takes an entire page. And this question, the question eight from the 2010 paper, basically says to all of those, wow, I'm so long because it's a whole page question, and says to all of them, hold my beer. Because when you have a look at this, it is not just one page. As you scroll through, these A, B, C, D, they're all connected. And as you keep going, you get to F and it says, it continues and you go to G and then H and then I and then J. There are 10 parts to this question. All 15 marks are one integrated whole. Um, and if there are no diagrams and no big slabs of text, it is completely algebraic soup. At least that's the way a lot of people first look at it um, and kind of that's their first impression. So we're going to sort of eat our way through this, chew through it very slowly. Um, what's the way to eat an elephant? Answer one bite at a time. And uh, we're going to stop at different points to sort of point out, you know, why is this challenging or are there any particular um, tricky things that you need to be aware of? However, I will say, as is often the case with these massive questions, this question is far more intimidating than you would actually think. Even though there are 10 parts, I'm going to put in an argument that really, uh, and this a very obvious uh, reason for this. Part C, the third part, is really the toughest part of this entire question. Then everything is sort of, well, I hesitate to say it's completely downhill from there because there's plenty of tough uh, working to do through there, but they scaffold it remarkably for you. Um, you can see um, questions will often say like, you know, hence or otherwise, or use part, you know, this or that. Uh, and these questions, you know, say if you have a look at part H, it tells you which parts of the earlier questions that you need to refer to. It says parts F and G. And then in part I, it says look all the way back to part E. It doesn't expect you to hold all of that in your working memory. So that's a bit of a relief, right? Um, and you can see, you know, the end part of this question, say I and J, uh, part G, F, D, they're all a single mark. So even though there's a fair amount of work um, to, to write out, um, conceptually, if you can follow along what's going on, uh, it's actually not that difficult. Uh, apart from integration by parts, which you can see called out there in parts B and C, um, and even from the notation of part A, um, aside from integration by parts, um, a, a skilled uh, and careful extension one student could navigate their way through this. And the inequalities might be a bit tricky, um, but conceptually, all the grounding and foundation are there. So, like I said, we're going to have a go through this question. But there's one last important thing that you should know before we start looking at the actual working, which is why is this question, why does it exist? Why is it the way that it is? Um, what's the big deal? What, you know, sort of possessed the HSC exam committee to devote 15 marks to this one question? Uh, well, if you have a look all the way down at the end, part J, the 10th part, the last one, it says, what is the limit as n approaches infinity of uh, this particular sum, right? So it says one on k squared, and then you're just counting up the integers for k. So it's one on one squared plus one on two squared plus one on three squared. And this problem here of what does this equal to? 1 over 1 squared, 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared, and then go all the way to infinity. The sum of the reciprocals of the squares is actually a famous historical problem, um, a famous historical maths problem. Um, and that's kind of what I think made the exam committee say, oh, it would be really cool if we could sneak this in. Um, you know, like this actual result, you, maybe you've never heard of it. It actually has a name. You know, when things are important and famous, we, we name them. Um, this problem is called the Basil problem. Uh, and it's named Basil not after like the herb or a person. It's named Basil after uh, a 
town in Switzerland where this problem was first posed. And it's not just like, why is this, you know, why is this problem and this, you know, town uh, named after like, you know, this problem? Well, or in reverse rather. The reason is because this problem played a really important role in mathematical history. When the problem was first posed, um, it sort of left mathematicians quite confused and puzzled. Um, all of the mathematical superstars of the day gave it a go and were unable to solve it for over 80 years. This problem stood for almost a century. And when I say like famous mathematicians, like really gifted people, I'm talking about people like say the Bernoulli family. You might have known about these guys from physics. Um, they weren't just you know, thinking about physical situations, they had to go at sort of, I guess you would classify this as a number theory problem, right? Which doesn't have any um, immediate apparent physical applications. The Bernoullis, they kind of tried it and they came up empty. And so a lot of people said, you know, when there's a problem and really smart people have a go at it, it's like, well, is this problem even solvable? There are actually some problems which we know can't be solved, um, which is it's weird, a, a weird idea all on its own. And the sort of mathematical community looked at the problem and thought maybe it is one of these, you know, that you can't really tackle. Maybe we should just leave it to one side. But then, like I said, 80 years later, along came a young mathematician who actually boldly said, I think I know how to solve this. And um, coming up with a solution um, immediately skyrocketed this particular mathematician to fame. And you might know him because his name was Leonard Euler, um, who we now call, you know, the master of all mathematicians. He just had so many um, insights and discoveries across all different fields of mathematics, not just like calculus or geometry or number theory. He did it all. Um, and what was amazing about his solution was a couple of things. Number one, um, it was kind of a, a controversial solution. It used a bunch of techniques that weren't widely accepted at the time, um, but he stuck to his guns. He came up with a solution for this problem, a specific value, not an approximation, an exact value. Uh, and then a few years later, he came up with a solution that was a little more rigorous, uh, you might say. And then, you know, other mathematicians then sort of took that on board and said, okay, fine, we accept it, it's rigorous. Um, and then, you know, after taking that result, um, it, that wasn't the end of it. People didn't just say, oh, okay, it's finished, we can walk away from this now. People took the Basel problem and extended it. Uh, the uh, German mathematician Bernhard Riemann uh, famously took this result, he generalized it. So when you have a look up here, you can see that the powers of these um, denominators, or the exponents rather, the indices here are all twos, so this, you're squaring it, right? So what uh, Riemann did was he said, well, what if it wasn't just squared. What about if you cubed the denominators or raised them to the fourth power or the fifth? Uh, and he named this function uh, what we now call the Riemann zeta function. And the Riemann zeta function is the subject of what is currently one of the most famous unsolved problems in the world in mathematics, and that's the Riemann hypothesis. A lot of people say they've solved it, but we still don't have something that everyone agrees. So it's kind of weird that the Basel problem, this sort of previously unsolved problem has now given birth to a new unsolved problem and I guess we're just waiting for the next Euler if there ever will be such a, such a person. So that's kind of why this means something special, right? That, you know, this incredible piece of mathematical history actually with the knowledge that you have access to through extension two, as like a 17 year old or 18 year old person, you can, you have enough knowledge and, and insight and skill to solve this incredible uh, piece of history, okay?